Huntsville Cheese Factory, Benjamin Hopkins, remembered that she was the maker at the Salford Village for many years. However, in an industry dominated by men, it was often Hiram, her husband, who received public credit. Even James McIntyre slid into this habit. Randy began with just two cows, which he in winter fed on brows, and now he hath got mighty herds, numerous as flock of birds. May he long live our hearts to cheer this great and useful pioneer. Hiram and Lydia were truly the pioneers of cheese making in Oxford, and much credit is due to them both for the overall development of the cheese industry in Canada. Hiram was born in 1792 in Vermont. His wife, Lydia Chase, was born in 1800, and they married in 1819 and resided in Vermont uh, until a bad loan to a family member uh, caused them to lose their prosperous farm where Lydia had been making and selling her homemade cheese and butter in the Boston market. Discouraged by a lack of available farms in the native state, they decided to move north for a fresh start and settled in Lower Canada in 1831. They remained there for a few years, and in 1834 they decided to, to move, go west, young man. And they uh, traveled 700 miles and ended up just uh, a couple of stones to roll south of here. The possibility of good soil and ready markets combined with the influence of Peter Hagel of Hegel's Corners convinced the Rannies to settle here in Oxford. It seems that Hegel's main objective, though, was to find a woman of Lydia's skill and ability and education to teach the children of the area. After staying with the family for several weeks, Hiram selected a 50-acre farm just a mile further down the road. By agreeing to teach, Lydia became the first teacher in Oxford County, at least the first that we have any record of. The small one-room school was uh, erected and she began uh, teaching. The first class consisted of 60 pupils. Some of them were like up to age 20. And a few of them even took up arms during the rebellion of 1837 on both sides. After five years, she resigned from teaching to devote all of her time to her household duties, which of course were similar to those of Vermont, and I mean cheese and butter making. She's considered the first cheesemaker in the county, and as soon as they had five cows, they started making cheese for their own use, and when the herd had doubled in number, they were able to start selling to markets in London, Brantford, and other neighboring towns. Lydia's cheese was not made in the factory, but in a lean-to or shed that was built behind her house. By 1838, the milk of 25 cows were being converted into cheese. She's also credited with introducing the cottage industry in Oxford. As an alternative to hiring farmhands, she offered to teach cheese and butter making to the young men and women of the area, who in return for instruction would help out with the Rannies and the different chores. By 1853, Rannies' original 50-acre farm had grown to 700 acres, and the original five cow herd had expanded to 100. In comparison, an unnamed neighbor had one cow, and being the good-natured wag that he was, he boasted that between he and Hiram, they owned all of the 101 cows to yourself. <laughs> An article which appeared in the Canada Farmer in 1864 reported that the Randy farm had 600 acres in tillage. And in addition to the 80 or 100 cows at that particular time, there were five horses, 120 sheep, and a few pigs. To get some idea of the kind of work done by Hiram, Lydia, and their children, Homer, Henry, and Julia, and others that worked on the farm. The following description of the Randy property was written by W.F. Clark, the editor of Canada Farmer. It says, the, the cows are pastured during the summer and fed on straw, turnips, and hay during the winter. Beside the cheese manufactured, they were, were raised during the past season some 300 bushels of wheat, 550 of oats, 300 peas, 2,000 bushels of turnips, 100 of corn, about 200 tons of hay, and 4,500 pounds of pork. The dairy season lasts from May to December annually. In winter, the cows are allowed to go dry, and each is expected to bring her calf in the spring so as to begin the dairy campaign with full supply of milk. The calves are usually killed at three or four days old, as it is found unprofitable to make veal of them. They are valuable only for their skins and rennets. So soon as the milk of the mother is fit for cheese making, the rennet of the calf is also fit. 
The rennet, which is simply the upper stomach of a calf and secretes a liquid, which has the, the effect of curdling the milk, is prepared for use by thoroughly salting it only. A good rennet will make from 200 to 300 pounds of cheese. The process of cheese making is as follows. The cows are milked twice a day, and the milk is strained from the pail into tubs, and forthwith its conversion into cheese begins. The milk is in the best state to receive the rennet at a temperature of about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The rennet takes about half an hour to operate. The milk begins to curd in 15 minutes, but it requires at least as much more time for it to harden to a proper consistency. When sufficiently hard, the curd is cut backward, forward, and crosswise with a mini-bladed knife in order that it may settle to the bottom of the tub and leave the whey floating on top. A cloth is then spread over the surface through which the whey is strained and dipped off into conducting troughs by which it's conveyed to the piggery. The hogs fed receive nothing but whey until the close of the season, when the supply of milk begins to fail and a few peas are given to finish them for butchering. After being cut, as above described, the curds are thoroughly broken several times with the hands. Then they are placed on a species of rack over a sink and left to drain for an hour. When they are put back in the tub, and being by this time in a somewhat solid state, are cut into pieces, two or three inches square, preparatory to washing. Whey is heated for the purpose of scalding the curds and washing out the remaining whey from them. The whole mass should be at a temperature of 100 degrees during the whole scalding process. After being washed, the curds are again placed on racks over the sink, cooled by pouring cold water upon them, and again left to dry for nearly an hour. They are then put into the curd grinder, a sort of cylinder with a number of short knife blades, or sharply filed nails in it. Nails work best. Turned with a handle in the same way as a grindstone. One person feeds the hopper with curds while another turns. The grinding is soon over and the next step is to salt the ground curds. Salting the curds is a very particular process and requires to be done carefully and thoroughly. Salted curds are then put into hoops or molds and are ready for the cheese press. Slight pressure is applied at first and in half an hour or an hour it is increased. Cheese are pressed for 24 to 48 hours according to size. They're made of different weights, example 30 pounds, 50 pounds, 60, and from that up to 250 pounds. The common size and that generally preferred is about 60. After the removal from the press, the cheeses are enveloped in a tightly fitting case of factory cotton and placed on shelves or counters in the cheese house to cure it. They are turned daily and every other day, though in the white mold which gathers upon them is wiped off with a cloth. They are fit for sale and use when about two months old. They cure and acquire flavor quickest in the heat of summer. Fall made cheese is necessarily mild unless kept in the, over another summer. The older the cheese, the richer and stronger it becomes. Hence, Epicures like whole cheese. So you can see there's a lot of work that was involved in manufacturing cheese this way. Well, it seems that this hard work uh, suited Lydia. She lived to be 100 years and three months old, dying in 1901. And she was responsible for giving many area cheesemakers their initial training and practical hands on experience. The Rennie Farm soon became what could be considered the first agricultural school in the country. The acquisition of 120 sheep, as noted earlier, enabled the Rannies to keep young women actively employed while not making cheese, and at the same time teach them the art of spinning and weaving. One of those young men who learned the art of cheese making from Lydia was James Harris, in whose family home we're now residing. It seems that young James was not just interested in how to make cheese, but he was also smitten with a certain young lady who had more intimate knowledge of Lydia and Harm Arab skills, and that was the Randy's own daughter, Julia. They were wed in 1848 and were witnesses to many changes in the dairy industry until her death in 1880 at the age of 56. It's interesting to note that within weeks, James remarried. The period of mourning wasn't the same for them. I wonder if Lydia had a predilection for courtship amongst her staff. James and Julia were not the only couple to have worked for the Rennie family who were later destined for marital bliss. Robert Facey emigrated from Cornwall, England in the 1850s and found himself working for Hiram and Lydia. Here he learned to be a cheesemaker, and when young Anne Calhoun 
came to Canada from County Donegal, she too found herself making cheese at the Southern factory. In 1866, Robert supervised the making of the mammoth cheese, right outside that window. <coughs> And later that year, he became the manager of the new three-story cheese factory in Harrietsville, which was then considered the largest cheese factory in the world. And, by the way, owned by James Harris. Robert and Ann were married the following year at the West Oxford Methodist Church, which is just a couple of kilometers down the road from here. James was a witness at the wedding. As the wife of the best cheesemaker in Canada, that was the title bestowed on Robert Facey by James Crawford, who assisted him with the making of the menu of the mammoth cheese. Anne's role would have included helping out the factory as well as providing meals and lodging for many of the men employed by her husband. Residing in the living quarters of the factory, she also gave birth three separate times. Following her husband's untimely death from a gallbladder attack, she continued to provide assistance to her son Edward while he took over the control of the factory. And in 1897, she also was known to have come to the aid of John Hamilton Scott when he and his young bride arrived on the scene when he became managing partner. Scott's recollections of the first years together pay tribute to his, to his bride, Hannah. Elizabeth, you're talking about yeah, Hannah. Yeah. Just imagine, if you can, a bride of today starting off on her honeymoon, if such it could be called on top of a load of boxes in a lumber wagon drawn by horses. The little house in which we spent the first six months of our married life, and for which we paid a rental of $3 a month, there was no cellar, no running water, no soft water, no refrigerator, hard water had to be carried from across the road, no separate dining room and kitchen. The bedrooms were so small that the doors had to be taken off to allow room for a bed and a dresser. But it was home, and we were happy. <laughs> At least that's his recollection. <laughs> Wages in 1897 were low, but then again the cost of living was comparable. When a dozen eggs cost eight cents, wages for the four experienced men working at the Canada Cheese Factory were $15 a month, plus board. One woman who also worked alongside the men earned $10 a month and boarded at her own home. Because everyone was extremely busy during this particular year, working long hours from 6 a.m. or to, to 8 or 9 p.m., with only quick breaks for meals, young Hannah Scott became very lonely and so homesick it caused her husband serious concern. It was at this point that Anne Facey took pity on everyone and offered to board the cheesemakers so that Hannah could go home for an extended visit. Sixty years later, things were not that different for women who chose to marry cheesemakers. Ruth Brown, some of us know, still recalls the culture shock she underwent when she married Erwin Brown and changed jobs from working at the bank in here in Ingersoll to moving out to the Banner Cheese Factory way out in the country, sort of up in the boonies. Besides bearing four children 15 months apart for the first few years, she too helped out in the factory and remembers how she struggled to reach in and over the back to cut the, the curd with the curd knives while she's pregnant. As a young woman who had grown up, really just she and her mom grew up in town, Ruth also had to learn how to cook for a number of hungry men. She had to prepare a big meal and have it ready by 11.30 when two of the men came in from the factory. They sat down to eat and then went back to the factory. Then another man was sent in and he ate and then he returned to work. And then her husband came in at one o'clock and had his big meal. And of course she had to clean everything up, look after four little kids, and get the next big meal ready for supper. But uh, she, you know, she admitted, like, well, why would anybody want to become a cheesemaker? And you figure, <laughs> The, the hard work, and that's something that a lot of people don't understand, the amount of hard work that was involved in lifting 90-pound wheels of cheese, 90-gallon <coughs> cans of milk, and all of it, and the steam and everything else. But uh, one of her other jobs was uh, darning her socks and patching her overalls. 
1870, the Ingersoll Chronicle uh, ran a, a humorous story that uh, I won't read right now, but it tells the story of a young bride who wanted to learn how to make cheese, and so she was told to go see Mrs. Smith. And well, Mrs. Smith, uh, the gist of the story is that there's no way she was going to share her secrets. And Mrs. Jones eventually realized that, so she was polite and waited another little while, half hour, and then went back home, with never finding out how Mrs. Smith made her excellent cheese. But uh, she might have been better off uh, reading a, an article that was published in the Oxford Tribune and the Canadian Dairy Reporter, published in 1877. There's a brief article entitled Cheesemaking on a Small Scale. It uh, provides the step-by-step -step directions and uh, also the fact that the, the cheese had to be rotated on a regular basis and then buttered so as to keep the flies off. And if the cheese was inclined to spread, then bandage would be needed. Throughout the history of Oxford, and indeed Upper Canada, there have been certain individuals who stand out for their abilities to overcome seemingly insurmountable challenges. Charles and Elizabeth Wilson are two such people. These two young people were married in 1845 and went to live in property in Deerham Township, which again is just south of here. Uh, the land that they settled was owned by someone